There will be three of us sharing this hour with you, and we first wanted to give you a brief introduction to let you know who we are and what we do here in Washington on behalf of the members of APA and FADS. As I mentioned, I'm Karen Studwell, and I've been here at APA for 11 years, lobbying Congress on the importance of federal investments in psychological science from cognition and learning, child development, sexual health, HIV AIDS prevention research, mental and emotional disorders, as well as peer review and protecting research infrastructure. Hi everyone, I'm Heather O'Byrne Kelly, a psychologist by training and like Karen, a senior legislative and federal affairs officer here in the APA Science Government Relations Office. This is my 14th year advocating on behalf of APA for the psychological research portfolios within the National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, and the Department of Veterans Affairs. I also run APA's Executive Branch Science Fellowship Program and with my colleagues lead a number of advocacy trainings throughout the year both here in Washington and off-site at many of your other society annual meetings and in university departments. Hello, I am Paula Skedsfold, Executive Director of the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, otherwise known as FABS. I've been in Washington, D.C. for 17 years working on Capitol Hill as a Congressional Fellow supported by APA at NIH in the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research and in the advocacy community, promoting our sciences on the Hill and in federal agencies. As Executive Director of FABS, I conduct advocacy on behalf of the scientific societies who are members of FABS. Before we get started, let me briefly explain FABS and what we do for our sciences in Washington, D.C. FABS is a coalition of 22 scientific societies, all of which share an interest in advancing the sciences of mind, brain, and behavior. We conduct advocacy on Capitol Hill and with federal agencies to improve funding for our sciences and research training for the next generation. Although our work is focused on federal funding and advocacy in Washington, D.C., at times we need scientists back home to join this effort. Now is one of those times because federal funding for science and many government programs is being tightened. We are partnering with APA, our largest scientific society, to provide this training so that you are equipped to lend your voice to this effort. Karen will now briefly describe the activities of APA's Science Government Relations Office and then get us started. Thank you, Paula. As lobbyists for the APA Science Directorate, we have the following four goals as one of our goals is to increase the ability of APA scientists to advocate for their own discipline, we have trained hundreds of individuals how to effectively advocate for their congressional representatives. While we might bring people into Washington or provide trainings at smaller society meetings, we hope that the webinar format will extend our reach to more of our members while still providing each of you with the information and tools that you need to pick up the phone or send an email to your representative's office to request a meeting to discuss the importance of federal investments in your area of science, and to use that experience to engage in the public policy process. As it is part of our mission to empower each of you to advocate on behalf of your discipline, we will be happy to assist you after the webinar is over to ensure that you are prepared. To give you an overview of what we intend to cover today, I will provide some background on the current legislative and budget issues that we want, to want you to take action on. And then Heather will provide some additional context and communication strategies for you. And Paula will end the presentation with specific next steps to get you started. And we will try to leave enough time to answer your questions at the end of the session. Now that you know a little bit about us, we would like to learn a little bit about you as well and your level of advocacy experience. We know a few of you that registered have attended trainings in person before, but some of you we don't know. If you could answer yes or no to the following polling question as it comes up on your screen, we can get a better idea of how engaged most of you have been up to now in policy. We will give you a few minutes to answer the following question. Have you ever contacted your member of Congress? And that could be about any issue, not just those related to psychology or science. I'll give you a few more seconds in case you were checking your email or otherwise distracted from the presentation. Thank you. 
As we know, some of you have attended our trainings before and have met with your congressional delegation here in Washington. And we hope that your previous experience has prepared you well to be comfortable scheduling your own meeting in the district. And a majority of you may not have any experience, and that's also fine. For those of you who have no experience, we hope that this training will provide you with enough information to take the plunge into advocacy. So why become an advocate? Although we may not always realize it, policy and funding decisions are made every day with or without your input. And there is a connection between the decisions made by a small subcommittee in Congress and support for research labs across the country, including yours. When Congress decides to make a statement about government waste, it is often scientists studying psychological, behavior, brain, and social sciences that end up being targeted by members of Congress. And it's our job to accurately explain why this research is so important. Congress has a lot to do and little time to be educated on all the issues they are voting for or against. Regardless of your area of expertise, as a scientist, your expertise puts you in a unique position to share research and knowledge that is relevant to important health, education, social, or national security issues. We will always need advocates, and it's a job that is never done. There were nearly 100 new members of Congress in 2010, many of whom had never held public office. Some of these new members came to Washington with the express purpose of cutting the federal budget, which means we have lots of work to do to educate policymakers about all the work you do, and in turn, that education enhances the value of all behavioral sciences. We're so glad you're participating today, as getting scientists more involved in advocacy is always a challenge, and we have asked our previous attendees why they may not have participated in federal advocacy before. And these are just some of the responses. Most often, people feel that they just don't have the time, either to read up on the issue, attend a meeting, even attend a webinar such as this, or to figure out the complicated process. As the academic season gets underway, it's even more understandable that people feel crunched for time. Some of the other reasons that you may share is that you may think it won't make a difference or that you're just very uncomfortable in that context. You don't know what to say and you don't really know how to conduct lobbying. And it can be intimidating for those who have never done this before. Given that we only have an hour, we do hope to make the most of your time and also make you feel comfortable enough to engage with your representative on these important issues to our organizations and scientists across the country. So why now? We often time our advocacy efforts for when Congress is in session and voting soon on an issue or bill that might affect our discipline. This year, we have a little different strategy, as at this moment, Congress is about to leave Washington to campaign in the district, so they will actually be home from now through Election Day on Tuesday, November 6th. Given the importance of these issues, we would like to help you take this opportunity to reach out to your own representative from the House. Remember that representatives are usually more accessible in the home district than they are in Washington. So your odds of getting to talk to your representative this fall are rather good. There are several reasons to be quite concerned about the state of our sciences within the current policymaking environment. The fiscal year 2013 appropriations for all the primary science agencies are still in flux. So the Senate is voting this weekend to keep most programs at their fiscal year 12 levels through March 2013 which will delay a final decision on the actual fiscal year 2013 levels. There also continues to be an increased scrutiny around the behavioral, social, and economic sciences, and there have been proposals in the House to eliminate entire disciplines of research from both NIH and NSF. Efforts also to increase the nation's STEM discipline and workforce have often left out the behavioral and social sciences. And worst of all, there's an imminent threat of across-the-board spending cuts or sequestration to most budgetary accounts, including scientific research, which would be devastating to scientists across the country. We will explain a bit more about that scenario later. Recognizing that you may all be working in different subdisciplines and are in different stages in your careers, we would like to help you educate your representative about the importance of your own area of science and why federal investments in research are crucial to the local economy, public health, education, private industry, national security, or eco and our economic engines for the district. We also want to encourage stable funding for science and to tell Congress that they must stop the sequestration. If they can do nothing else 
or the results will be devastating to researchers and students in their home districts. <clears throat> Although we only have an hour here today, we are going to be repeating these points several times. So just to be clear, <laughs> these are the current issues that we are concerned about. And, and secondly, the two messages we're going to ask you to deliver to your member of Congress. First, the current political and budget climate is a threat to science including the sciences of mind, brain, and behavior. Second, Congress must act to prevent large budget cuts from happening automatically on January 2, 2013, what is known as the sequester. So this is a preview of the message we would like you to deliver to Congress. First, we would like you to explain to your representative how your research contributes to the public health and I understand you all do different things, so it doesn't have to contribute to all of these things. <laughs> but for your individual research projects, they might have contributions to public health, perhaps education. I know some of you work in autism. Some of you also work in workplace productivity or national security. And because these research projects are bringing money to the district, they're considered vital to the economic health of the district. And second, we need you to tell your representative that 8% cuts to domestic spending will hurt science in general and your research in particular. Ask for his or her support to stop the sequester and for stable and sufficient federal investments in research agencies across the federal government. As sequestration is not limited to science programs or even public health programs, but it is scheduled to cut nearly every defense and non-defense discretionary program. So we have been working with a coalition of thousands of organizations that oppose sequestration and are working to educate Congress about the devastating impacts it will have if they don't act to stop the sequestration. So you're not alone in your efforts, and we'll be joining with thousands of other individuals who are all working to prevent cuts to these core government functions. So now we're going to go over a little bit about the legislative process. And occasionally these will be about 10 to 15 slides, but for the purposes of today, we've narrowed it down just a little bit. And before we get into the details of sequestration, we just wanted to give you a brief background on how the legislative branch operates, as your representatives are serving in the House of Representatives. Your senators also represent you, but their district is the whole state, so you will have a higher likelihood of meeting with your representative, and they will know your community and your concerns will likely be of greater importance to them. Depending on what committees your representative sits on and which party he represents, he or she may have more or less influence or capacity to address your concerns. However, your representatives need to be held accountable for their decisions that have a direct impact on your ability to pursue and sustain your own scientific research careers. As you will be reaching out to your member in the House of Representatives, we just wanted to give you a little background on who these people are, and we encourage you to look up your own member if you don't know or have not done so yet. There will be links provided later in the training to help you do that as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. As an overview, there are 435 members of the House, which is currently controlled by the Republican Party, while the Senate and the White House are currently controlled by the Democrats. Members in the House are elected every two years, but your representative is essentially always running for re-election and is more familiar with local issues and the local constituency. By contrast, senators only run every six years and represent the whole state. So other than running for re-election, one of the primary roles of Congress is to provide legislative authority for government programs through what's called authorizing bills, and also provide annual funding for the programs that have been authorized, and that's what we are focused on today, which is called appropriations. As the government is quite large, Congress divides the appropriations for all functions of government into 12 different funding bills and among 12 different appropriations subcommittees that address different functions of government. NIH, for example, is funded under the bill that funds the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education. The National Science Foundation, by contrast, is funded under an appropriations bill with the Departments of Commerce and Justice. If your member serves on the subcommittee that funds an agency, she will theoretically have more knowledge of the agency and also more influence over its funding level. As the fiscal year begins on October 1st, appropriations bills are supposed to be completed by September 30th each year, but this rarely happens. 
However, each subcommittee drafts its own funding bills, sends those to the full appropriations committee, and then the bills would be sent to the floor of each chamber, one for the House and one for the Senate. If the bills are different, a conference committee of House and Senate appropriators would work together to iron out the differences, and the resulting bill would have to be approved again by the full House and Senate. When different parties control each chamber, the process doesn't exactly go by the book, as we have seen in the recent past, and this year as well. At this point, Congress and the administration have agreed to a continuing resolution, which would essentially delay the final votes on fiscal year 13 funding will keep funding levels at their fiscal year 12 levels until March of 2013. Continuing resolutions are considered emergency funding bills, although they are used quite regularly when Congress can't reach agreement by October 1st. So while it would appear funding might be at least stable under, until March 2013, it is a bit more complicated than that because of the looming threat to all discretionary spending, what we call sequestration. So what is sequestration? Some of you may have heard about it in the paper so far, but the bottom line is that it is an automatic, across-the-board 8.2% cut to both defense and non-defense discretionary spending that is scheduled for January 2, 2013. Discretionary means that Congress has the discretion to fund these programs, as opposed to mandatory spending like Social Security. It does not mean that they are dispensable by any means, and this is not a cut directed at science. It is a cut that would apply to nearly everything the government does. It would cut funding for not only NIH and NSF, but funding for food inspections, education, air traffic control, the national parks, hurricane and weather monitoring, the FBI and criminal justice programs, basically everything. And this slide sort of gives you that um, overall picture of everything it would cut. Pretty much anything you can think of that the government does would be cut under the sequestration. So where did it come from? The Budget Control Act of 2011. As some of you may recall, the last election in 2010 resulted in a renewed interest in slashing the federal budget and finding ways to address deficit spending and debt reduction. The Budget Control Act that passed in 2011 established a bipartisan committee to find $1.2 trillion in budget savings and tried to encourage compromise by including a threat to both defense and non-defense spending that would be automatically cut if they failed to reach consensus on a deficit reduction plan that could have included both entitlement reforms as well as tax reforms. This committee was called the Super Committee. And while they tried, ultimately they failed to reach agreement. And each party blamed the other for their lack of compromise. So even though sequestration was seen as a doomsday scenario enforcement mechanism that was not supposed to come about, the administration must now figure out how to absorb 8.2% cuts across all functions of government. So what does it mean for science? According to NIH Director Francis Collins, it would be devastating to the investigators who have been funded by NIH for years. But it would be even worse for first-time investigators who are just starting their own research careers. More specifically, an 8% cut to NIH would likely drive the success rates below 10%, stifle medical discoveries that save lives and drive our economy, impact scientists in every state across the nation, causing labs to shut down, scientists to be laid off or not hired, and local businesses that support research centers would close. So in real numbers, and this is easier to, <laughs> to, to, to read, uh, we're talking about a 2.5 billion cut to NIH in January 2013, and a $586 million cut to NSF. And that's as simple as we can make it, and as devastating as it sounds. And that will happen unless Congress takes some action to stop the sequestration on January 2nd. The only way to avoid those cuts is for someone to tell Congress to stop them. And Heather is going to walk you through how you can do that successfully. Thanks, Karen. This is Heather. No pressure. Uh, we know this material can take a while to sink in. So first of all, remember that we will be posting these slides. And we'll also be sending you an email with all of these written materials. So rest assured that we'll, you'll have more of this information in your hands. Um, as Karen mentioned, this, the funding situation certainly is very serious, and it can be very discouraging. But I want to help you turn to what you can actually do to have some impact. Because as Karen mentioned, your voice is important, 
and maybe even most important in times like these when there are limited resources and Congress is forced to cut programs. It's absolutely vital that members of Congress have a more sophisticated understanding of how science affects their communities and the nation more broadly. And you're with us today because you want to be involved at this critical point in time. So I want to highlight how you can most effectively advocate, starting with some general context and strategies, and then getting more and more specific about an actual meeting with your member of Congress and or a staffer in the district office. Paula is then going to tie together Karen's content about the budget and appropriations and sequestration and my communication strategies by walking you through the exact steps that you'll take to schedule, choreograph, and follow up on your live meeting. So in general, there are numerous ways for scientists and for APA and FAB's staff to advocate for psychological science and the results of our research at the federal level. Uh, this slide shows some of those strategies. You can communicate with your senators and representatives through personal meetings in Washington, which usually end up being with their staffers. You can take meetings back home in their district offices, which is, of course, what we're asking you all to do. Um, you can draft and present what's called public testimony that's delivered to congressional committees, either during hearings or offline for their staff use. And we as organizations do that quite often throughout the year. Uh, we often have individual scientists invited to testify on topical issues at congressional hearings. And often scientists and organizations at multiple levels send letters, emails, and telephone calls, and also work through more indirect channels that include media placements, such as letters to newspaper editors, paper, radio, and TV ads, billboard sponsorships, and so on. APA and FABs are able to use all of these approaches, but of course our training with you all today is geared towards handling a person-to-person -person meeting in a district office. So policymakers at the federal level have not only multiple constituencies, but multiple concurrent agendas. And certainly we all hope that, that these members are focused on meeting the needs of their districts and their states. And though they may have very different ideas about how to think about national problems and solutions to those problems, we also, of course, hope that they care deeply about challenges like economic well-being, health and safety, education, national security, et cetera because they can only act on those issues from within the halls of Congress if they continue to stay in office, members of Congress also, of course, care about getting reelected, getting media attention that is flattering, and arming themselves with arguments to trump the opposition. I know this all sounds obvious, but I'm mentioning this explicitly to reinforce the point with you all that no matter how well any given legislator understands or values the importance of science or any particular scientific funding, science will never ever be the only factor in a policy or political decision that gets made. It's our job and it's your job to make sure that science is at the very least one important factor in those decision-making processes. So it's important as an overall advocacy strategy to be thoughtful about when, what, why, where, who, and how kinds of questions relevant to your issue. APA and FABs, or you as individual scientists, are going to be most effective in talking with federal legislators when you have a clear message and a specific request that is also timely and directed at the right person or group with power to affect that issue. Earlier I used the word choreograph and that was very purposeful. We all have limited chits to use and we want to use them well. This may be the only meeting with this staffer that you ever get or at least that you get this year. You're a psychological scientist with expertise that is relevant and a request that's timely. Uh, as Karen mentioned and, and walked you through, Federal funding for science is under attack, unfortunately, and members of Congress have the power to affect that funding. Here's why those members of Congress or their staffers want to meet you, or they should want to meet you. You're a scientist from their district who can explain in a non-political and non-partisan way why psychological research is valuable to their community and to the nation as a whole. You have examples of work that has made or could make a difference in the world in some way. And the federal government should continue to invest solidly in psychological research because no one else will, and our nation would suffer without this knowledge. This is where the thinking that went into your one-page biographical briefs will come in handy. It's really important as scientists to be able to convey why your work matters and what the nation gets in return. I want you to picture yourself telling your smart but perhaps non-scientist neighbor why taxpayers should fund your work and what would be lost if the federal government stopped investing in fundamental and applied behavioral science. Here I'm going to repeat those talking points that you heard earlier from Karen, since again, they'll be the most important part of your actual meeting. You're going to tell Congress that psychological research is critical in addressing your district's and the nation's challenges in areas ranging from public health and economic growth 
to educational achievement and the national security and so on. Cuts to federal research budgets will hurt your research specifically, but also science more generally. And you need your representative support to maintain stable and sufficient federal investments in research agencies across the federal government. You're also going to do some education about how the process of science works. Research dropped in these areas, for example, as a result of cuts to federal programs will not be picked up in the private sector, which, as we know, focuses on much more near-term profit and product development. That is not necessarily something that your representative or his or her staff know. So let's talk about some general communication strategies or do's and don'ts for when you're visiting with a member of Congress or his or her staff. Paula is going to get into more specifics, but in general, it's important to realize that this is not just a, quote, normal conversation or even a regular meeting with which most of us are probably most familiar. What we call Hill visits in Washington, or in your case, district visits, have a shape and a set of rules unto themselves. And we want to help you be a little bit more comfortable with those before heading into one. So first of all, there's a balance of powers involved as a backdrop to these meetings. Uh, it may seem obvious, but the po politician's power lies in what they can make happen in Washington, whereas your power lies in your ability to keep them in Washington or vote them out. They have power to say yes or no to legislation, and you have the power of information, information that they want and need to be effective policymakers. This meeting is your chance to ask for something very specific from them and to share a rationale for that request based on your scientific expertise. The meeting is brief and focused. I want you to remember that part in particular and above all, respectful and polite, whether or not you agree with the representative's overall politics and policy stances. The meeting can also be unusual in terms of setting. And we try to remind people of this going in so that you're not surprised by chance um, you know, if you end up sitting in a hallway, for example. District offices are not usually very glamorous. And your meeting might take place in an actual meeting room, but it also could be out in a communal space where other people can hear your conversation. And we want you to think ahead of time that that could happen so that you're comfortable with it. You could meet with a young staffer or someone with far less advanced formal education, but remember, that person has far more power than you have within the policy arena. It also uh, is not an equal sharing of information in the way that we're used to in conversations. You often will be asking and saying more than what you'll get in return, and we want you to be comfortable with that also. Most often, these staffers cannot speak for the member of Congress beyond a general public stance on budget issues, for example, but they will take the information and request uh, that you share with them and pass it up their chain of command to a higher ranking legislative director. You really will have made a difference simply by showing up, sharing your expertise and its relevance to the member's district, and by asking pointed questions. And we want you to know that in advance in case you come out of the meeting feeling as if you didn't get, any, get many specific promises or information in return. The basic do's are to be polite, brief, and engaging. In effect, you want to take this very dry budget information about scientific research and bring it to life by telling a story that captures for your listener why you study what you do, why the work is relevant to the district, and why your member of Congress should stay up at night worrying about how to fund it in these lean budgetary times. Give local examples of how your research has helped or could help a segment of the population, especially a local part of the population. Stay on message. This is really important. Paula will tell you how to introduce yourself, remind you what your talking points are, and help you close the meeting by asking the member to stand for science in tough times. The staffer you're meeting with may, well may have other off-topic questions for you. Remember that many people still think that all psychologists are clinicians, and they may have mental health or other kinds of questions for you. We really want you to feel free to say that those are not within your area of expertise, but we also want you to say that your colleagues here at APA and FABS in Washington will be happy to get back in touch with their staff with more information on those topics. Then we want you to get politely right back on message. And the same goes for any other sort of off-topic conversations, like social chit-chat. Because these meetings are in your district, district, you may well have people that you know in common. So for example, if you realize that you and the staffer have um, a friend, a mutual friend back home, go ahead and spend a minute talking about that, but then politely segue into why you're there for the meeting. The basic don'ts also focus on being polite, brief, and engaging. First of all, please don't underestimate the staff, no matter how young or different from you that they are, since these staff have the power within the office to, at a very minimum, pass along your information and request. And at a maximum, they really can help develop a relationship with you as a smart, useful, constituent expert. And that's our end game uh, with you all, is for you to be seen as a resource for this office. 
please also, no matter how tempting it is, don't use this opportunity to discuss politics or the upcoming election because that will just muddy your purpose for this particular meeting and it really can potentially alienate staff. The only exception is if for some reason you've been a campaign volunteer or a donor for the particular member with whom you're meeting or, or his or her staffer, and then by all means mention that before launching into your talking points. It, it is appropriate to say that you've uh, been a supporter of this office and they do want to hear that. This is not the time, though, to list all of the policy stances or votes with which you disagree. This really is, again, a focused meeting to ask the member to fight for science. Remember that sometimes members with whom you disagree on other issues will be on your side for science. So now is the perfect time to bring all this together in a more specific context of your meeting. So I'm going to turn things over to Paula. And before I do that, I'm going to remind you also that please feel free at any time to send your questions in, and after Paula goes uh, through some of the specifics, we'll start taking questions if we have some time at the end. Okay, let's take a few minutes to walk through the specific steps you will need to take for a successful visit with your member of Congress. Step one, prepare for the meeting. First, you will need to identify your member of Congress. This information is readily available on the House of Representatives website at www.house.gov. Once you get to the site, look in the upper right corner of the page near the U.S. map and you will see the words, Find Your Representative. Type in your zip code, including the four-digit extension, and you will be connected to a page showing your representative and a map of his or her district. Next. Click on the representative's name, which is next to his or her picture, and you will be directed to his or her website. Here you will find almost everything you will need to know about your representative. A biography hi highlighting his or her education, career, and perhaps number of years in Congress. Information on the committee, subcommittees on which he or she serves, and priority issues, things that are relevant to the district. Become familiar with your representative's background and issues, as this may help you frame the description you prepare of your own research. Try to make it relevant to something they care about. Now that you have identified your representative in Congress, it's time to prepare a one-pager explaining your research and why it is relevant to him or her. In other words, why it is relevant to the district, the health of the nation, the local and our national economy, national security, etc. Just spend a few minutes thinking about how your research is relevant and build your one-pager around it. In the few minutes thinking about how your research is relevant, excuse me, in the materials provided before the webinar, we included two excellent examples of one-pagers, one by Deborah Bim Davis and one by Bonnie Call Nastasi. These are actual examples that have been used effectively in Hill visits and both agreed to allow us to share them with you. You will notice that each includes a brief description of the scientist, their area of research, and why that research is important, and both do so in lay terms. The one-pagers will help you develop the brief message that you will actually deliver to your representative. At the end of the meeting, you will simply refer to the one-pager and leave it with him or her. Ask the representative or district director to share it with the relevant staff in the district and Washington, D.C. office. Be sure to include your contact information and funding agency, if applicable. The next step is to actually arrange the meeting. On your representative's homepage, you will find information about the location of the Washington, D.C. office, as well as district office or offices. Find the district office that is most convenient for you, get the phone number, and arrange for the meeting. Specifically, call that district office and say something like, and here I'll use the example of a scientist and friend of FABS and APA, uh, someone from the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, uh, say something like, uh, hello, I am Fred Oswald, uh, a scientist and professor at Rice University and a constitu constituent of Representative Culberson's. I would like to schedule a brief 15 to 20 minute meeting with the congressman or the district director to discuss federal funding for science and its potential impact on my research. Is he holding office hours or are there other opportunities for him to meet with constituents? If you can schedule a meeting in the office, 
do it. Find a date and time that works, allowing plenty of time for traffic and parking. If the only time that works is a town hall meeting with other constituents, get the date and time. We'll walk you through this scenario in a few minutes. Now, let's prepare to deliver the message, again, assuming that this is a meeting in the office. Arrive early, since of course you want to create a good impression. Be polite at all times. It's truly the easiest way to create a positive context for your message. Remember to be flexible. Although you need to be early, they may have been held up at another meeting with constituents and will appreciate your patience. Remember why you were there to deliver a few key points about the impact of cuts to science and its potential impact on your research, the district, and or the nation. Develop the brief, say, two to three minutes, lay friendly pitch, and hone it as needed to make sure it is relevant to your representative. After you deliver this brief message, you will thank the representative or their staff for their time and leave behind the one pager. Again, please ask they share your concerns and contact information with the Washington, D.C. office. The actual votes will occur in D.C. and the D.C. staff will remind them about constituent concerns before the votes. All right, let's walk through the specific message during the meeting, your talking points. You'll say something like, thank you for taking the time to meet with me. I know this is a very busy time for you. I am Deborah Bem Davis, a psychological scientist at George Mason University, and this is a good time to provide your business card. Uh, then say, I'm very concerned about the current budget climate and its impact on funding for science through federal agencies such as the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health. You can mention others if you have funding from them, uh, for example, the Federal Aviation Administration or the Institute for Education Sciences. You should continue with a description of your research and its relevance. Uh, you may say something like, my own research has been supported by the FAA. It examines limitations in our ability to process information and the impact on human-machine interactions, such as pilot errors in the cockpit. This research helps us understand the errors and build training programs to reduce them. The research saves lives and helps train the next generation of scientists. It also provides support for our university at a critical time. Then you make your specific request. Say, I urge you to protect federal investments in science through the appropriations bills. We also need your leadership to identify a reasonable, balanced approach to avoiding the significant, automatic 8% cuts to science due to sequestration. I understand that science must address Federal, uh, excuse me, I understand that Congress must address federal deficits, but we must also protect investments that will help our country and district grow. After you make this specific request, pause to await a response from the representative or staff member. If there's no response, you might inquire about the representative's prior leadership on issues related to science funding or their support for NIH or NSF funded research or even issues affecting the university. Keep it conversational, but get a sense of their support for the issues you have raised. If the opportunity is there, you might also mention how federal research is funded, since many non-scientists do not know. They think funding stays, uh, for example, in Bethesda, Maryland, at NIH, instead of going to universities around the country. So you might say, the federal funding that I receive through NIH provides a portion of my salary as well as support for two graduate students in our department so that they are prepared to begin research careers on their own in a few years. It's a boost to our local economy. Again, keep it casual, but get the point across if you can. Finally, finish on a high note. Say, thank you very much for your time. I'll leave this summary of my research. Please have your staff here or in D.C. contact me if you could use someone with my expertise. And then finally, after the meeting, send a brief email thanking the representative or staff for taking the time to meet with you. In it, you should restate your key points. 
the issue and action you would like for them to take. You might even offer to show them your lab after the election and again mention that you are a resource. Then let us know how the meeting went. We are advocating for science funding at the federal level, so it's important that we learn whether your rep will lend their support. Finally, we will periodically issue what we call action alerts in which you can, with a few simple clicks of the mouse, send your representative a note on an urgent matter. Please, I urge you, please sign up for both FABs and APA's action alerts and respond when we need you. The web addresses are uh, provided on the slides here. And that's it. We're happy to assist you throughout this process if you need any help. Uh, and to get us started, I guess, on the Q&A, which I think we're, we're at that stage, um, let me start with a question about uh, giving your message at a town hall meeting. Okay, so let's say you learn from the district office that your member of Congress is not holding office hours in the district, but will be appearing at various town hall events. Ask the district office where and when the town hall events will occur and whether you need to register to ask a question. Next, prepare your brief question. I would recommend writing it on an index card so that you can say exactly what you need to say. Arrive early so that you can introduce yourself to the district staff. And again, be sure to give them a business card when you introduce yourself. Sign in to ask a question if, if needed. Then sit in the front of the room or near a microphone. When it's your chance to speak, mention who you are, your concern, and then finish with the question. So you might say something like, I am Fred Oswald, a psychological scientist at Rice University, and I'm very concerned about the tight budget climate and its impact on funding for science, science that it's, that's important for this nation and our district. And then now you want to, the, now the question you want to, to state. And remember, this is going to be for the record since it's a public event. So the question would be, are you working to protect federal investments in science at the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and other agencies? Also, are you working across the aisle to find a balanced approach to cut the deficit without massive cuts to science coming as a result of sequestration? Then give your representative time to answer. And after, as soon as you can after the town hall meeting, send us an email and let us know what they had to say. Okay. So uh, we have additional questions. Um, our email addresses are listed here. Just send any one of us an email if you have questions uh, during this entire process. Uh, and now we'll move on to other questions. Hi, everyone. This is Heather. I'm going to first start by saying that because we started late at th uh, after 3 o'clock, we're currently finding out from our tech people if we can go past 4 o'clock a few minutes to handle some of these questions. In the event that we cannot, we wanted to first say thank you, apologize for the technical issues, but also leave this slide up until the end so that you can at least jot down our emails if you'd like to email us a question that we weren't able to answer on air. Um, so thank you very much. And again, you'll be getting an email from us very shortly next week with a lot more detail. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question we got was from Joseph. Uh, and he asked, aren't there a lot of people doing this in the university town? And our response is, oh, we so wish that were the case, Joseph. Uh, no, there really aren't. There are lots of people in a university town who would um, who think about doing this and want things to happen in Washington but do not actually take the time to go schedule a visit for all of those reasons that Karen mentioned, not having enough time, not being totally sure of the issue. Um, so y you will actually be relatively rare if you actually go in and take a meeting on this particular issue for science funding. And if you do it in a nonpartisan, nonpolitical way, that will make you stand apart. Um, we will look at the group that signed on today and check those of you with matching zip codes and send you an email later in the uh, next week suggesting that if there are any matches, people who live in the same town who might not already know each other, we'll put you in touch with each other if that's all right and suggest that you work on a visit together. Um, so we'll take care of that and then I'm going to pass you to someone else to take the next question. Thanks, Heather. Um, the next question um, basically asks if you know someone in a senator's office, whether you should go to the Senate staff as well um, as the House. 
And I would say if you have a personal relationship with a Senate staff that you can get into that meeting and you geographically live close enough to make that meeting, then I would say um, by all means you can use the same materials to speak with your senator or their staff as well. So I would encourage you to make the most of that relationship um, and pass along the same message because it really is um, both um, houses of Congress have to get together to address the sequestration issue. So all voices to all um, House and Senate offices are helpful. We were focusing on the House um, today in the district office because the districts are much smaller and will give you a, a better opportunity to actually be able to make those meetings in the districts. When we bring folks to Washington, we of course would send you to all of those offices because they're just right across the street. <laughs> but where you are, they're probably um, maybe 100 miles away. So I'm going to hand it off to Paula um, for one more question. Okay, uh, Janet asks, uh, are we willing to review the one-page briefing sheet? And yes, we are. Uh, our email addresses are uh, still up. If you uh, know one of us from a prior experience working with APA or FAPS, feel free to send it to, you know, to one of us. If you don't know us, then send it to all three of us, and, um, and we'll split them up. But we'd be happy to look at them for you. Hi again, this is Heather. So thank you for sending the questions in. This is great. We made up some sample questions we thought people might ask, and you're asking completely different questions. So this is great. Um, we have another question set that says, does having two or more people with a staffer in a meeting appear to be ganging up on the staffer? Um, I love that you would be nice enough to even ask that question. Um, the answer is no. It is not ganging up on a staffer. In fact, it's really the norm to have a small group of people uh, from a district or a business or a university go in at the same time to meet with a staffer. So in Washington in particular, uh, you know, five people going together to meet with, with a staffer is completely average. Um, so no. The one thing we'll, we'll talk about with you all uh, is if you do have a couple people on the meeting, please just practice ahead of time with each other so that you could even role play a little bit about, how, and again, with that choreography of the meeting, who will say what, how will it go from your end, just so that it goes a little bit more smoothly once you get there and so that all of you have the same expectations and that you're all on the same message, that you all can keep to the time, you all have a chance to say a little tiny bit about your research, um, and that no one's going to be sort of saying things off message. So no, a couple of people or up to five, I would say, is an absolutely acceptable number to go in and meet with a staffer as long as you're all polite and all on message. Okay, our next question, and we get this a lot, which is, uh, should we go if our own reps and senators are already supportive? Um, and I would have to tell you, yes. Um, whether, whether your congressman is on your side or not, it is always worth a visit. Because no one thinks sequestration works as a policy, most members of Congress are actually opposed to it. Whether they're opposed because of the cuts to defense or they're opposed to the cuts to domestic spending, pretty much all of them might agree with you. Like, yes, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> but most of them, because they were not prepared for this, have absolutely no idea how this will impact their constituents on the ground. So anything that you can do to help provide them with information is actually very helpful to them. And if you have a very supportive member, one thing that members of Congress almost never hear is thank you. So if you take the time to go meet with your member and thank them, if they're big supporters of scientific research funding, then say thank you. And also let them know that all of these cuts coming from sequestration will have a personal impact to you in the district. And it may be hard for you to figure out that personal impact, but just imagine that your research grant is cut by 8 to 10 percent. And just imagine that the next time you go back to compete, they say, no, we don't have any money. So how devastating would that be? And then, you know, maybe you can formulate a good response to that. Because absolutely, you know, no one really thought that sequestration would happen. Um, so no one actually knows what the impact will be. But we know if you calculate an 8% cut to research, to your own research, to the amount of people, you know, who can benefit from services, it's quite large and substantial. So hopefully that helps. And I would encourage you to visit, you know, all the members, whether you think they're supportive or not. Okay, the next question is, uh, I work in a corporate setting, should I use a different approach? And the answer is, uh, in general, no. I mean, you'd use the same, uh, the same approach. But just highlight um, an er your area of science and how you're using it uh, in the corporate setting. Uh, so, for example, if, um, if a particular area of science has been used to, um, you know, to save uh, money for the corporation, definitely highlight that. Members of Congress love that. As specific as you can be uh, would would be would be best. 
Hi, this is Heather. So we got a great question. Um, this question is, I'm a postdoc. Will I be taken as seriously as a professor? I love that question. I think we've all been there. Um, and the answer is yes. Actually, it's one realm in which you are taken as seriously as a professor. And in some ways, they are more interested in hearing from you um, for a couple of reasons. One is that it, you will often be meeting with someone closer to your own age than to some of your more senior professors. Um, and so they like to, to know where you are and what you're doing. But also because in Washington and, and back home these days, it, training uh, in the sciences, the pipeline issue for future scientists is a huge, huge issue. Most members of Congress are very interested in and concerned about where our future competitiveness and innovation. And so by, by um, extension, where our next scientists are coming from. And so they're very interested in hearing from graduate students and postdocs and young scientists. So I would actually be um, putting yourself forward very much as someone who's in this training realm and is really concerned about the future, your future as a scientist, where the research funding will come from, whether you can even stay in this field and be a part of that, that science pipeline with the way that the funding um, threats are taking place. So actually, yes, and I think you have a very interesting story to tell precisely because you're a postdoc. OK, I think this is the last question. Um, what, if you, what if you can't schedule a meeting for the exact week in October that, um, that uh, we've uh, encouraged you to visit your, your member of Congress? Uh, that's fine. We still, we'd like for you to do October 9th through 12th, if at all possible. But if you can't do it that week, just try to get it in and try to do it before the election. After the election, they're going to be back in DC, and they're going to be voting on a number of these issues. Uh, but so we'd like for you to focus on this as soon as you can, um, you know, before the election. Uh, now, this is not to say that after the election uh, that you still ca you can't speak to them, but it would be extremely helpful to do it before they're back in D.C. voting on these issues. And of course, we hope that you will develop a relationship with them and that they will call on you in the future and that you will be able to contact the office uh, in the future as well. Actually, it looks like there may be one more question. Well, one of the other questions is coming in. We had another earlier one. Um, we touched on this briefly, but the question was, do you have any tips for a person meeting with a representative with whom you disagree about everything? Um, <laughs> for many of you, that might be the case. That is often the case. And again, we suggest that it's very important um, as a constituent to talk with someone with whom you agree and someone with whom you do not agree. Because as we say here in DC, your friends are not always your friends and your enemies are not always your enemies. Psychology has the benefit of being a very broad and a very deep field. And so we have a lot to say about a lot of things. And a member with whom you may not be able to connect on a particular hot social uh, social issue in particular, for, as an example, you may disagree or you may agree much more so with on um, a completely different issue. So from the standpoint of there may be things you can find agreement on, it's important. But it's also important if there literally is nothing that you agree with to go in and register your voice as a constituent of this person who represents you in Congress. It's absolutely important that that office know where his or her constituent stands, whether they stand with you or not. So we encourage you to use your voice so that they know that there are scientists who are actively engaged in their community who will stand up and say publicly, I disagree, and it's important for you to hear why. So yes, we absolutely encourage you to go in. OK, well, I think that takes care of all of our, oh, I think we have one more question coming in. I think someone asked maybe again whether it's OK to meet with your senators. And I would say yes, if you have the time and can. Let's see, one more question. What do I do if my representative isn't running for Congress? <laughs> or your representative is Paul Ryan. <laughs> so, OK, so first, if your representative is not running for re-election, please go ahead and meet with them anyway. Because one, you know, one year they're a congressman, next year they're running for governor, next year they're running for the Senate. So they're usually addicted to the public policy atmosphere and often find themselves in leadership positions again. So a visit to a retiring congressman is not a visit wasted, I would say. And no one wants to answer the Paul Ryan question, I would say. But I, of course, would definitely go meet with Paul Ryan. <laughs> I think this is Heather. We're all weighing in, actually, on that one. Yes, I think you should absolutely, if he's your member of Congress, go in, try and meet with that office. Uh, you know, it just 
obviously it's going to be near impossible to meet with him personally um, if for a one-on-one -on -one meeting, but again, he may be having town hall meetings back in the district. He's obviously having meetings all over the place. Um, but absolutely go and weigh in with his staff um, on this issue. It's very important. He's still an active member of Congress. Um, and it, as they formulate campaign and campaign issues, it's very important for you to weigh in. So I think we're, we're saying, yes, please, and just don't be surprised if there's not a chance um, there's not a chance for you to physically meet with him. All of these people will be back whether they are reelected to their positions or not for the lame duck session, which is what we call it in between the election and when everyone takes, um, takes their seat in January. So there will be votes in the lame duck session that are important for science. And so ab please go in and try and meet with anyone who's your current member of Congress. Just one brief follow-up about that. Uh, this is Paula. Uh, the House's budget is starting from a lower starting point, and it's Paul Ryan's budget, basically. And it is uh, putting the federal, uh, trying to fund the federal government at fiscal year 2008 level. So it's a significant cut. So um, he needs to hear from his constituents. Uh, his staff need to hear from the constituents. He will agree with you that uh, you know he'll say that the, there's a huge um, federal deficit problem and we need to address that. You can agree with that. But we need to take a balanced approach to dealing with the deficit, and we need to protect important investments in science. So that's the message that we want you to convey. OK. I think, I think that's it. Yeah, so I think those are um, all the questions that we had time for. And thanks for bearing with us with our technical difficulties. So we got started a little bit late. As a reminder, we would like you to try to schedule your visits the second week of October, right after Columbus Day. So you have some time to prepare your briefing sheets, and we can help you review those. Um, I did send an email out. This is Karen. I sent an email out to most of you who had registered yesterday. So you should have our email addresses already if you look in your inbox. Um, we will be sending you additional materials, including a discussion guide to help you review the talking points, as well as a one-pager with a specific request um, and a flyer from our non-defense discretionary coalition that you can leave behind with the office as well. If we did not have time to get to your question, or if you think of one as soon as you log off the broadcast, please don't hesitate to contact Heather, Paula, or myself, and we will be happy to help you. And on behalf of APA and FABS, we thank everyone for joining us today and look forward to hearing from you after your visits, if not before. Have a great weekend, everyone.